Today's little sort of introductory session, and introduction to seminar, this uh, kind of short set of slides, is kind of is aimed at giving a little bit of an introduction to business. What are businesses trying to do, and why are they trying to get so much out of this rather overhyped thing called business analytics and predictive analytics? And it fundamentally requires an understanding of how businesses are looking at where they're going to go in the future. That's what strategy is. Strategy is about where are we trying to go over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Now, one of the problems I have seen over the last 35, 40 years that I've been involved with business and teaching and so on, is that Western company or organizations, UK, America, Canada, basically the white Anglo-Saxon uh, Protestant countries, have a remarkably short-term perspective on where their companies are going. Uh, that's in contrast to the sort of time horizon that companies in, say, Japan tend to, to look at their operation of business. These white Anglo-Saxon Protestant countries I mentioned, Britain, um, USA, and quite a lot of the U European continental uh, countries, they are driven by the stock markets. The directors of the company have incredible pressures to manage their shareholders' sort of value, their stock price, their share price, in the short term, day by day, week by week. They have quarterly horizons, so that they look, tend to think six months is kind of mid to medium term, and long term strategy is, gosh, I'm thinking about positioning my company in the next two to three years. They will then pay a little bit of lip service in their long-range planning to five years, maybe ten years. Some organizations like the major aerospace companies like Boeing, Airbus, Rolls-Royce, General Electric, Pratt & Whitney, and so on, they kind of think about, you know, we need to think about when the next product's coming along, the, the new aircraft. The Airbus, they had, and Boeing, they had the problem of what comes after the 747 and the A330, 6040. And they were think, had to think about a development time scale for a new aircraft, new jet engine, for around about 10 odd years. Five to 10 years. And then selling that for 15 years to 30 years after that. But an awful lot of companies don't really think about strategies other than, oh, well, the direction we're going is that way for the next few years. So what we need to think about is, okay, so you have a direction. It might be relatively short term, or it might be like Japan, a hundred years time scale. And Jap most Japanese companies hardly worry two hoots at a, a senior management level, executive level, of what's happening to their share price on the stock exchange. It is kind of there, but they're thinking about where is this company going to be for our children's ch children's children. Hundred year time frame is a typical Japanese kind of perspective. So we have this thing called strategy. But we also then have, okay, so that's where we're trying to go, over there somewhere. But we also have to worry about what's happening today in terms of what's going on inside our organization. Are we making the sales that we had planned? What is the level of sales? What does that mean in terms of our pipeline things that are coming through, the things we're making or people are making for us, our supply chain, and is it working okay? Have we got the right sort of level of inventory? How's the money in the bank? And all the management accounting stuff. But that's operations. So I want to look at both of those because ultimately a company has to have successful strategies and also successful operations. And the way you handle that lot is very, very much data. Huge amounts of data. Strategy is kind of small amounts of data because it will fit on a simple spreadsheet. But if we're looking at big organizations, there's tons going on there. 
When you think about this university, operationally, we have somewhere around 22,000, 24,000 students. So if you think about the operations of Blackboard, how many of you, how often do you go into Blackboard, each of you? Every day? Three, four, five times a day? Moving through all these things? So you can see there's quite a lot happening. And then at the end of the uh, semester, when done all the marks, got all the marks, marks and so on, by the end of this week, we have to feed all of those marks in. So there's kind of 22,000 students worth of marks, or three, two or three modules going in. Suddenly, tch, lots of stuff going in, and then we do lots of stuff with it. That's the operation side. But you need to keep the two things moving together. And that's where business intelligence uh, and analytics kind of come together. Making sure that that lot, A, is working properly, and B, it's helping us to meet those longer term uh, directions we're trying to go to. So strategy is about the future. Where are we going? Where do we want to be? How do we become successful compared to our competitors? So in the UK, there's something like 110 different universities. We're just one out of 110. And many of you will realise that when you applied through UCAS, you went onto the UCAS website to find where am I going to go to university, where are the courses I'd like to go to. Now, some of you from the local area thought, oh, I really only just want to go to Derby because I want to live in Derby and I want to go to Derby University because it's local. Some of you might thought, well, I live in Derby, I can live in Derby, but I could think about going to Staffordshire, go to Notts Trent, Nottingham University, I go to Leicester, Leicester to Montfort. Uh, and you know, you've got a catchment from here, 30 miles radius or so, 35 miles radius, you've got about six, eight different <coughs> universities. Or if I move away from the cap here, or you're moving out from wherever you live, you know, that becomes more difficult because you've got 110 universities to choose from or more. So we as universities need, in terms of strategy, are thinking about how do we position ourselves compared to uh, Montfort, Lots of Trent, Staffordshire, and so on. What is it that we can make that's really compelling to you guys when you're applying? You want to come to Derby first and foremost. That's what our strategy is. Develop a range of programs, um, content, curricula, approaches to teaching, approaches to learning and assessment, which are going to help you to become excellent students, excellent graduates, and stunning um, employees when you leave this place. That's the sort of thing that a lot of universities here are working on in terms of our long term direction. Other things also, partnerships with other universities around the world, colleges around the UK, um, and <coughs> getting arrangements so that people will feed across from, say, the, Arab, the Gulf states at second year or third year, after they've done some work, then they come here to do their final year. That's all part of future direction. That set, maybe will set us apart from other universities so we can be distinctive in what we're doing. And distinctivity is actually quite important in developing future thinking or strategy. What makes it sustainable, long-term, achievable, and protect, we can protect our future um, differentiation. As part of that, you're also looking at as that long-term sustainability of our competitive nature. What is it that we can control? Not events will control, but we can control. And there's this balance between what events will do, what the world will do, and what we can actually manage and make happen. So you've got to start thinking about that. So you've got to start with quite a lot of information about what's happening out around there. Amongst your competitors, the way that things are changing, so that if you think we've got Blackboard here, nicely controlled and contained, and those pe people who have access to that are basically those who are on the University of Derby campuses, basically here in the UK, and some of our partner universities, uh, partners, have, uh, students have access. But you've heard of things called <coughs> MOOCs, have you not? Massively um, open 
uh, environments where people pour in, tens or hundreds of thousands of people register <coughs> each module, and there's something goes on in the background, maybe some AI technology to help mark and assess so that people work together, and a lot of working in, in groups, small groups and pairs and so on, and self-assessment and peer assessment goes on. And then at the end of it, you don't have a, you have a, a certificate of you actually did it, but not necessarily a graded one, unless you pay to have your work graded. And there's all sorts of developments going on in the field of learning technology. And so we have to be thinking about those, things that will actually work, not that are the latest wizzo idea, but then disappear. Because an awful lot of things happen in all industries, the hype cycle, as Gartner called it, things come along and everybody says, wow, these are fantastic, we must pile in, get on the board, and it goes up this hype cycle to a peak of massively over-egged uh, over expectations, and then it kind of falls down, ah, it's not going to be as good as we thought it was, and, 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 and. And there have been, over the last 10 years, a whole range of technologies that are supposed to be fantastic for you guys, and your predecessors would have had a look at them and said, not this. If you think about social media, as an example, over the years, last <coughs> five, six years, social media are fantastic. We ought to be using Twitter, we ought to be using <coughs> Facebook as part of our teaching process so that you can do your collaboration between each other in Facebook or something. And then we realise, actually, that might not be the best thing. Even with closed Facebook groups, all people who, for very, very good personal reasons, do not wish to have Facebook, for example. They may have had a really bad experience um, with a public Facebook, and that's switched them off completely. So Facebook was thought to be the most fantastic thing. And then some other students told us, that actually, we want to keep our private life and our student life separate. So then they have the problem of they need to create two uh, Facebook accounts. One, the private life, the personal life outside of university, and then they somehow have to con the system into giving them a second account, which is their kind of university account. So they can work together. We can do that now inside Blackboard, which is our learning environment here. And so lots of these things come, and then you guys look at it and say, we thought of it from our perspective as academics and learning technology experts, but you, the users, only tell us, no, 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 that's not going to work. We don't like it. Then you tell us some other things which we hadn't really thought about, but we'd love to have this. And then we think about that, and then we build it in. So there's lots of things about scanning the outside world, the environmental scanning, as we call it, that tell us where we might be able to go then we have to make decisions about controlling that so that it's successful for you or Rolls-Royce or Airbus or Boeing or General Electric or the big pharmacology, uh, pharmaceuticals companies. Each of them have different sets of external environment. They have different way, different sort of decision making to help them to choose the type of future that they're going to go to. But this involves large amounts of data. A lot of organisations who are new to the sphere then say, OK, well, we've got this strategy sort of direction. That's, that's the strategic planning group. They can sit off in that corner there and they can do their thing. And we'll see them once a year and they will tell us where we ought to be going and what's happened in the past and whether we're going that way or that way. But you need to actually build this strategy into the whole company. And there's a little, huge number of authors and there's about half a dozen at the back of this sli of these slides, the bibliography of some of the key um, writers in this whole field of strategy and operations. It has to be proceduralized so that you actually know what you're doing, otherwise it all goes pear-shaped remarkably fast. Now, first guru, Mintzberg. And you'll see here something interesting. We're going back to 1984. Quite a longish time ago. But we are still citing 1984 sources. Now, you're doing a business module, aren't you, this semester? Or was it last semester? Last semester. 
And mostly they were telling you, you need to get your references and your sources within the last five years or so. Which is entirely correct because that's the late, it reflects the latest knowledge. But this tells there are occasions when something truly important happened or a truly important uh, academic paper or book was published that set a new direction. Uh, Mintzberg did this in 1984, and he said this sort of thing. Now, up till then, there had been quite a bit of stuff going on about in the field of strategy and the future, and so he tried to dehype it, trying to put it back into real context, saying, actually, all this stuff about the importance of strategy and integration and so on, Yes, it is, but it's just part of management. It's just another of those things that the team management, the senior management team, need to get their act together about. Crystal balls. Yeah, Gypsy Peg does not exist with her crystal ball that you go into this little sort of tent and She'll tell you your future. Really what Mintzberg is saying, actually anything that's happening from now into the future, we do not really truly know what's going to happen. Things are inherently uncertain. I mean, Hey, we finish here at what, six o'clock? And we will go down to our cars in the car park or we'll go down to the buses and we hope that the bus is there. It's timetable for, I don't know, 6.15. And then we think, ah yes, plus or minus mm, five minutes, 10 minutes. Or worse, you go to the bus stop on the way here and you've left a little bit late and you know that the 8.15, bus or the 8.30 bus or the 8.45 bus will get you here, whichever the schedule is, at two <coughs> minutes to nine I can just get into my lecture. Unfortunately, at the moment, the Burton, uh, the uh, Utoxa Road is kind of messed up just outside the hospital. And so the traffic coming in and out of town is kind of difficult. So your two minutes to nine ain't going to happen. But because it happened over the weekend, or the last weekend, I forget when it was, Thursday or Friday, it worked. Monday, Tuesday, it's not going to work. It kind of changed as a traffic jam. That's just a local little incident here. But if you are a manufacturing organisation or a service provider, whether you're very small, just two or three people making, I don't know, scented candles, or really big organisations, things happen. It said, I mean, you heard of project management and Gantt, how, how many have heard of Gantt charts? The way of laying out your task and activity with time. It said very, very regularly, as a sort of a kind of reminder, that Gantt chart, that program of activity you publish and the resource allocations are your best guess at the time you finally publish it. And it is then out of date within almost days. Of the world will not cooperate with you. Things happen, events happen, people go ill and can't do the job. Specialist item. So if we are looking into the future, the big things we can kind of guess. So if you go back to that aerospace one, Airbus and Boeing, when they launched the A380, the Airbus and the Boeing, 787 for Boeing, two fundamentally different ways of understanding how we, the travelling public, would want to travel. Boeing had had the biggest aircraft ever, the Boeing 747, with little passengers, for the best part of 40 odd years. 
carrying four, three to six, five hundred people between major centres from London, maybe to Delhi or to Johannesburg, jo um, JFK, New York, uh, maybe Dallas or Las Vegas. Most of those would be to the central hub, and then people would go out on little baby play, little planes to their final destination. That was a Boeing model, but they felt they need to move away from that because they were seeing <coughs> indication that people actually like to fly from Manchester to Las Vegas or from Manchester to uh, some smaller little Charlotte, perhaps in North, North Carolina. And so they wanted a smaller plane. Whereas Airbus thought, well, we've had lots of smaller planes. But we think it's going to be hub and, hub and spoke again, rather than point to point, which is the 707 Dreamliner. And so Airbus and Boeing swapped concepts for some reason. Neither of them really knew which was right, because they'd both seen, and everybody in the aerospace world had seen, that both the big jumbo approach worked, as also the point to point one. And so they very uncertain events, so they don't understand how we're going to change our decision making, so, and they need a plan on the horizon of 30 to 40 years with a 10 year development program. Things are very, very uncertain. When here, the universities, you've gone through the uh, problems of fixed student fees. When you first applied here, you probably thought you were going to be paying fees of 3,000 quid a year with a student loan. Then it suddenly went up to six and a half, seven thousand, 7,000, and it'll go to 9,000. Some of you have got student loans as well for your uh, some part of your living expenses. And next year or the year after, the government may have changed the ground rules so that nobody gets a, um, a student grant. You all have to have loans. And it changes the way that student people who are applying to university think about how much debt can I take on, do I want to take on, and some people don't even think about it because they know it's capped at 9% of income when you graduate and get a job for any salary over 21,000, so hey, who cares, from an income basis. You know, lots of things are going on and are changing the dynamics of how students are going to think about coming to university. So our thinking of the future is changing year by year, literally, changes that sort of kind of course of the kind of chart. It leads on, and we'll see this next year in IT services management, about maybe we don't need to manage risks so much, we think about uncertainty. And this is a new way that's been developed about thinking about your fu the future in terms of strategy making and the decision making that Mintzberg's talking about. Think about where the level of layers of uncertainty are, does that have an effect? Interestingly, uncertainty is actually part of some research we're doing um, here at the University of Derby in terms of location services. You know, the fact that these things claim to record where you are. They have location services, GPS and other things. But actually, most of the time is not very accurate and it has some fairly interesting implications to people trying to send you uh, adverts. It has interesting implications for people who are relying on these for knowing where they're going. It'll have fascinating implications um, in terms of, say, Google smart cars and so on. Can they find my house accurately? It has will have interesting implications, this sort of uncertainty, at a very close level if Google, sorry, Amazon starts sending drones. Because unless they can actually see the number on the front of your door, they're going to deliver your present, not to your house, but to your next door, but next door neighbour probably. Three doors up or down the street, or perhaps if you're in America, it'll land it in the middle of your swimming pool rather than your front door. Things are uncertain at all levels, not just long-term strategy, but also short-term. So, certainty. One of the V's of big data, of data itself, the, uh, 
Uh, there's a set of words that start with V that challenge us as we think about our data and what we're going to do with it, how we can do what we want to do with it. There's a V for veracity. Kind of how truthful is it? How accurate is it? And that leads us into these sort of questions. If you're thinking about some businesses, they want to find out what their customers are thinking at all times. So they'll try and use Twitter or maybe Facebook. And they'll do some text analytics and, some, um, and sentiment analysis to try and find out what we're thinking about their product, their service, their company. So that leads to the question of what information do we need to do the sort of work we want to do? <coughs> and that comes back to some of the location services research we're about to do. What information and how accurate is it? Because that veracity problem will have significant impact on whether we can even use the data safely. I mean, an example of this sort of thing was Santander a, few years, a couple of years ago mentioned uh, that they were using um, Facebook and Twitter to find out where things were going wrong. What they were looking for was early indications of problems in the services that their staff were giving to us, the public. Now, they were very wisely not using that to go shoot the person who had given wrong service or had messed up. What they were looking at was how do we prevent those sorts of problems becoming significant? So it's an early warning of something's going wrong, we need to go and find out what's going wrong, why it's going wrong, and fix it. So it wasn't a matter of shooting messengers or anything like that. It was, we need to fix our processes. And so they were looking at what information do we need? Well, we know, and they were saying, well, we know that in Twitter and Facebook and other sort of places like that, if something goes wrong, people are going to tell 10 people. We've known this for 30 odd years. If something goes wrong with a service or a product, I will tell 10 people. If it goes right, I probably won't bother to tell anybody. But I might tell as many as three if I'm really impressed. So that's that 10 to 3 ratio between good news, good news, sorry, bad news and good news. And so they, were, they, could, they knew they would get the bad news. And if you talk to, you know, if you go to little restaurants, cafes and so on, who do have Twitter accounts or Facebook accounts, you will and talk to the managers or the owners, they will tell you that they can hardly be bothered with it because all they get is abuse all the time. Because the only people who bother making comments most of the time is, I've had a bad time. Don't come here. And the fact that they are one in a hundred isn't easy to tell. So it's hugely skewed. Where? How much is, is there? So we've got tiny little bits. So, that, you know, this bad news from Twitter, from Facebook, and all the other social media. You know, if, as a businessman or businesswoman, you know most of my customers are pretty satisfied, but I, and then I look at those numbers, you'll see very quickly, it's about 1%, well, probably, unless you're really doing things badly. But how much is it, and how truthful is it? How representative is it? Go back to V for veracity. 80% says John Easton of IBM three years ago, 80% of the data we have around us is of uncertain veracity. What it means is, actually, by and large, we don't know which data that we've got is accurate or is not accurate. And even if we can identify the data that's inaccurate, mostly we don't know how much or by how much it is inaccurate. Location service is a magical example of this. And we, there's lots of data we have here in the university now shows it's difficult to detect which locations are accurately represented and for the, the most of it that's not accurate we can't tell immediately from one item of data whether it's out by 10 meters 100 meters or 
1,660, 1,600 kilometres with a single snapshot. If we have enough data, we can begin to get a bit of a feel. And so, on being unsure, data analytics, business analytics, all may help us to begin to address that question. This and all of that uncertainty and certainty applies both to the long-term strategy thing and also operations, day-to-day -day doing things. So we end up with these, some of these things, or these four here plus many other P's. What is our plan? And one of the things that data analytics will help us with are the patterns. The patterns that have happened in the past and the patterns which we are kind of hoping we can project into the future to confirm our decisions and our direction, provided nothing else changes. And that's one of the fundamental things about patterns and statistics, which is what most data analytics is built on, is an assumption that what happened in the past is happening today and hopefully crossing everything we've got, fingers and toes and so on, will kind of, we hope, happen the same way into the future. And that's what predictive analytics is all about, taking what's happened in the past and projecting it forward. Long-term strategic plans, yeah, we start off with what has happened, what we know has happened in the past, what the patterns are in the past. We kind of know where we are today as a position. And our preferred strategy is projecting that pattern forward into the plan for the future. Now, we might take account of uncertainty by looking at this pattern, or this plan, sorry, and that future direction to take account of possible, conceivable changes in what's happening that will affect what we do in the future. So we try and understand the past, we try and understand the variability, and try and build this long-term plan with some patterns which reflect kind of where we, what we think we know. But unfortunately, to use um, that lovely term, the unknown unknowns that uh, Dick Cheney uh, talked about 10 years ago, it's the unknown unknowns, the things we don't know that we don't know, which are going to come and bite us really badly about the whole of that. Even the things we know that we don't know are pretty important and kind of make like mean that we can provide a few alternatives around that to cover the things we, we know we don't know, the uncertainty. But it's the unknown unknowns which really tend to foul that up. And if you think back over the last six years to the uh, credit crunch, we still, broadly, have no new financial, macroeconomic financial models that will predict what happens as the central banks of the USA, UK, Europe, unwind quantitative easing. Nobody has the foggiest idea what happens when that's when will happen when that's unwound. Some very very difficult known unknowns that change. You know, there's almost no real strategy because we can't model it. We don't know what the patterns are, and this is kind of very unnerving to people who are using analytics and modelling or economics, because they've always been able to rebuild their economic models within a couple of years of something happening. And then they know it will last for six, eight years, and then on a 10, 12 year cycle roughly, 10, 15 year cycle, they kind of fail and they build a new one. But here we are, seven years on, it's eight years on, and they've still not rebuilt the macro macroeconomic models. So there are times when this nice <coughs> approach doesn't quite work. A few words, just a simple definition of those four words. The plan is kind of written down or told. This is where we're trying to go because the plan side. There are also patterns about the way companies, while they've got a management team, they tend to have a consistency. And then when the chairman or the, and or the chief executive are changed, things suddenly go over there, what over there. <laughs> These are some ideas that 
kind of helped to, to understand about the you know, strategy of big businesses. And then Porter, Michael Porter, another immensely influential uh, guru about business. And the position we're talking about here is, okay, so this is our long-term strategy, and this is the sort of service, the sort of products that we are going to be doing, producing, and this is what we think is how the market will meet or react to what we're doing. And probably also, this will have some look at uh, the competition. So here we are in the University of Derby, and over in Nottingham, 15 miles away, we have the University of Nottingham and the University of Nottingham Trent. And in Brit Leicester you have the University of Leicester and you have the University of Mon uh, Montfort University in Leicester. Now our positioning is University of Derby does not compete with University of Nottingham or Leicester University. We compete with Notts Trent and De Montfort. So clear positioning at a kind of level. And we certainly don't position ourselves to compete with Oxford and Cambridge, or Warwick University for that matter. And if we'd positioned ourselves as that, we probably wouldn't have applied here. Because we'd have had you know, UCAS points of four, five, six hundred if we were trying to compete in that sort of field. So from a university position, you know, we're looking at UCAS points of what was it about? 250, 300 for you guys, was it? Or somewhere around there? I can't remember quite what you, you, you come in with. Um, but you apply to universities which position themselves in the process of, say, UCAS points of such and such is what you need to have to come here. That's how we do our positioning in our market. Others, like Oxbridge, you know, they'll have 600 plus UCAS points. And they won't look at you if you don't. Are we looking inside ourselves or are we looking outwards? And we actually have to do both. We have to look at how we are operating in relation to where we've positioned ourselves in relation to our uh, complete competitors. What do we want to do for aspiration? <coughs> that means, what would we love to be? If we're going to be really, really successful, where are we going to end up in five, ten years? In definition, we need to be thinking about our competitors, and we have to do kind of SWOT analyses, we have to think about what, are, what their strengths are, their weaknesses, opportunities for us in them, and threats and so on. And now, we can turn it into what do they do well, what do we do well, what do they not do so well, and what do we not do so well, and try and match those so that we, both, we certainly from inside, look at ourselves and we're going to position ourselves so we're fully successful in this way. And then where will we end up? <coughs> so briefly, for a few minutes, in your tables, thinking about all of what I've covered, now you are looking at your business. What sort of data, what sort of information are you going to choose, and you might want to, for each table, decide on a particular type of organisation type of business and think about what data, what sort of analyses might you do uh, perform as you look into your future direction. Okay guys? Couple of, couple of three minutes, or briefly.